joy, a privilege to introduce my friend, one of my sons in the ministry, and I love him with all my heart, Mark Rohde. Hey, God is good, amen. That last part's really embarrassing because I get that ugly face cry going. My, uh, that's, that's my spiritual dad, uh, Dr. Fred. How many of y'all have been blessed by the TV ministry for decades uh, from the first Bozier days? Man, it's, uh, he's a blessing, man. It, uh, and for him to take a chance uh, on me so many over 13 years ago because I'm just like, I'm just for real like a nobody trying to tell everybody. <laughs> that's, that's how we talk in the hood, y'all, everybody. <laughs> y'all going to have to track with me. All about somebody that saved my soul, amen. Uh, to him be the glory for everything that he's doing uh, in this community, in this church, through his church. I just want to thank you, Pastor Kirby. Man, uh, when I saw your last name, I was thinking about the old vacuum cleaner sales days. No relation to the Kirby family. <laughs> but, uh, and then, uh, Brother Doug, thank you. And thank you all for all you do partnering with us uh, over in the Bozier Elementary community of Cumberland, a.k.a. K-Side, if y'all have uh, heard, heard that on Channel 3 or some of the local news. But uh, thank y'all, I mean, for the last over a year, uh, close to two years, um, not just on mission. Like you, you sent me uh, sent me a report, a praise report, from uh, had over 100 go to Mission Arlington. That's one of the uh, first mission trips, both of my kids who are now 25 and 21. But it changed their life. And it, I'm sure it changed your lives that uh, went there. Been to France, been to New Orleans, about to go to Mexico, and now Prague. I need to get on that one. <laughs> Come on. But, uh, but no, thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's an honor to be here with you all this morning. Just really just to give praise and honor to the Lord. He's the only one worthy of our praise. Amen. Y'all give it up for the praise team, by the way. Come on. Hey, if this is your first time at Eastwood, or maybe your first time in a long time, you're not here by accident. We don't believe there's anything, any such thing as coincidences or accidents. But uh, our prayer this morning is that we'll just continue fanning the flame that the Lord's already started, you know, in, in the heart and, and lives of uh, members and the family here at Eastwood to just stay on mission and, and live a life. It, it truly, I mean, you opened it up perfectly. In fact, I was, I was nudging my wife. I was like, come on, when you were sharing. I mean, that, that was the, the message I was going to bring out of. So we're going to skip that. I mean, why repeat? You already brought it. Let's go. I'm just like, come on, Holy Spirit, uh, just moving. So, um, yeah, so for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but the power of power, love, and a sound mind and discipline. Amen. And so our prayers that you leave here changed on fire maybe there's some of you here we can't just assume just because you uh came to church on sunday that you even have uh, have ever asked jesus to save you by grace through faith because we're all sinners in need of a savior amen amen so if you if you want to uh be be the difference outside the walls of the church the change is something that first uh, happens on the inside because we're all born with a heart of stone and the holy spirit wants to give us do a heart spiritual heart transplant remove that old rocky that old stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh give us this holy spirit to be on mission with him so if you want to uh if you want change you have to first be changed and that's something that spiritually happens from the inside out amen amen come on all right now we also uh, our prayer is that uh, you leave here encouraged equipped and powered uh, to again, again, live a life on mission for King Jesus wherever you go. Not all of you are called to be, you don't have to be on staff at a church, as Pastor Kirby said. You don't have to be, uh, we're all called to be ambassadors and on mission uh, for the Lord. In and, and my prayer, I say, I share the scripture a lot. It's in 1 Corinthians 2. You don't have to turn there, but it's really, it's really the heart behind uh, my prayer that what happens today. In the first uh, five verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, And when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. 
For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. That's like for real, like much trembling. I had that like that pregame kind of deal going, had to go to the bathroom. No, uh, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, and then we're going to get in. Lord, we love you and praise you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about you. Uh, again, you're the only one worthy. I pray that every word from my mouth, I know my wife's praying for my filter right now, but I pray that every word will honor you and bring glory to you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. So I'm just going to take, I just, I really feel like Pastor Kirby and, and Doug, their heart was just to, to share about like what led up to men of courage. You know, because the statistics show that you know, there's only a three and a half percent chance that your family will come to salvation through the leadership of a child. There's a 17% chance that your entire family comes to salvation through the leadership of the mom. Did you realize that there's a 93% chance that your entire family comes to salvation through the leadership of the dad? Man, that's a, that's a responsibility for your dads. How many dads do we have in the house? I know we just had Mother's Day last weekend. But man, it, and maybe you're in a situation where you aren't able to, to be a dad, you know, biologically but you can be a spiritual dad or mentor there's a lot of fatherless situation going on and and on our ministry table for Cumberland Farms we even have the seasoning seasoning it's called who's your daddy yes yes soul food season but it has really just a tool for us to share about the mission and vision of the ministry uh, there uh, in the shadows of Margaritaville there by Bass Pro Shops in the Bossier Elementary neighborhood there but it's the fatherless epidemic that's not just in Bossier Parish or Caddo Parish. It's all throughout the country and beyond. It's a fatherless situation. So, And really the whole point of it is, is to challenge men to man up and be the spiritual leaders in their home. And so, many, you know, so with my personal family, we just celebrated 25 years uh, last fall. And uh, we have two that are, uh, man, my son, he graduated from Tech two years ago, doing commercial real estate in, uh, in Dallas. And my daughter's a senior at tech and nursing school. Like, we are living the dream right now. No grandkids. Neither one of them are married. So we're living the empty nest, living the dream right now. So, uh, But I, I, I mess with people all the time and just say that if, uh, if Carrie ever leaves me, I'm going with her. You know what I mean? So, so uh, but, yeah, that's my Wonder Woman right there. So, uh, but I, wanna, I want you to picture at the, when it's all said and done, and you've breathed your last, and you're face to face with your Creator. There's going to be imagine, uh, imagine this, this super clear screen the size of this back wall. That's and it's going to play a DVD of your life, from the moment you were conceived to the moment you breathe your last. You know the Bible says that we're going to have to give an account for every idle word that comes up comes out of our mouth. That's kind of scary, isn't it? But I'm just going to give snippets. Uh, snapshot of just defining moments throughout uh, my life because I believe that the enemy can't stand when I share my story and there's nothing special about it. I, I believe he can't stand when you share your story about how you met the king of the universe, uh, the king of the universe, right? Because in Revelation 12 it says that the enemy is defeated by the blood of the lamb and the testimony of the saints. Amen. So you got if you've had an encounter with your Creator. You have a story to tell. You have a story to share. The enemy doesn't like it. He doesn't want you sharing, but it's your story. And they can't deny what the Lord has done in your life. So, you know, it's uh, pretty ironic that God called me to lead and disciple men. Uh, is my mom here by any chance? She's going to be embarrassed. She probably won't. She doesn't like uh, when I, <laughs> she's, uh, hey, she may not be here. She says she's, going, hey, mama. Hey, oh, she's so embarrassed. No, Y'all don't turn around and look. But she's she's the real hero, you know. Uh, she raised three of us by herself.
I'm the baby. You know, she's still, she's still, it gets embarrassing some, you know. We'll be out in public or whatever, and she'll introduce me to her, her friends or people. That's her baby. She'll start squeezing my cheeks. I'm like, I'm almost 50, you know. So, But anyway, she's a proud mama. But she raised, my dad rolled out when I was one. Really never had a relationship with my earthly dad. And I know she worked around the clock, you know, uh, just providing for, for us three. But I, I can only imagine. It's a struggle with two kids and having Carrie and I to do the to do the load much I, I'm sitting so I think back at what she went through um, just making ends meet and, and 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 working around the clock and everything but I remember I think I was around five years old in a uh, first Bozier Dr. Fred had just uh, was just called to Bozier and uh, they started a little van ministry and I remember several times my mom just like y'all got to go I need I need a break y'all go you know but, I, but it was those early years as a kid that I, I learned about, um, you know, Noah's Ark, right? And, uh, or David and Goliath. Seeds were planted at an early age uh, through that ministry. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, uh, there was a few weeks, uh, just a short season, that we found ourselves in the Siesta Motel. You ever been down Highway 80? It's real, real nice. But... Uh, but, man, I actually smelled something the other day that reminded me of it. I'm like, wow, that's crazy how, like, 40 years later, I'm just like, smell that smells. Like, man, that smells like the Siesta Motel. But, uh, and I might be getting it wrong, but, um, but from what I remember, my mom was calling around to different food pantries just to, just to help out. You know, I've always been thick. You know, I always, I wore the husky jeans. You know, I was, I liked to, a brother liked to eat, you know. So, uh, but she was calling around and, from the, what I remember, the church, same church that picked us up a few years before in the van, I had a food pantry at the time and brought us groceries to eat. And uh, again, outside the walls of the church, you know. A few years later, uh, we're living on Northside Drive. It was like a block or two north of the tracks, you know, there. Two Johns wasn't there at the time, you know. But, uh, and they were talking about youth camp at, at First Bossier, and I'm just like, man, I really want to go. And Miss Dana came up to me, and she said, you want to go to camp, don't you? I was like, I do. But we broke. We, we don't have $300 or how much ever it was to go to camp. She said, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. And someone anonymously scholarship me to uh, go to camp that year. We went up to OBU, Washita Baptist University in Arkadelphia. Amen. And uh, that summer, before my eighth grade years, the summer of 1988, I'd heard the gospel as, as clear as anything. And, and leading up to that, I remember hearing about, um, you know, John 3 and Jesus with Nicodemus. And, uh, and you must be born again, you know, to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he's talking. And I'm sitting here as a as a 12-year-old just thinking, like, how does that work? Kind of like Nicodemus. He was a whole lot smarter than me. But, like, how can I get back in my mama's belly and be born again? And But but it clicked that, that summer at camp. And, man, I, I remember being in a break, went in our little dorm room. I was by myself. On, my, on the top bunk, and uh, I asked Jesus to save me, y'all. I asked him to forgive. I knew, I, I knew if I were to die that day that I would live apart from God forever. I deserved hell. We all did. And it, I don't even remember the prayer. It, it was just a simple prayer of like, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I need you to save me. I'm going to tell y'all that, that that day in that dorm room in Arkadelphia, Arkansas, Jesus saved me that day, y'all. Come on. To him be the glory. Come on. If you've ever had an encounter with Christ, you shouldn't get over it. That's nothing that you can get over. If you really know what you deserve, and you, we, you really know what, what, what we're really destined to, and man, um, I didn't really make the connection until years later, probably more like 13 years later. But that, that week at camp, I got a heavenly daddy that will never leave me or forsake me. Comes that ugly face cry again. Lord help. Oh man. But God, God is so good, and I and I wanted to share those those times because it was the church. In each instance, the church was outside the walls, being the church. Whether it's and I don't know if y'all have an old van or so, or something that. And I'm not saying that. Hey, every church needs to have a van ministry or a food pantry or sponsor somebody to go camp. But I'm telling you, 
if God's telling you to to meet a need or get out of, of your comfort zone, say yes. Be obedient to God because I know it changed my life. Amen. Amen. Fast forward uh, a couple of years, uh, about four years later, it's the summer before my senior year, and I just so happened to be working for an apartment complex uh, that I lived at, Parkland Villa Apartments. Remember that, Cindy Lou, on Shed Road? I went my, working that part. We get a call from my ex-stepmom saying that my dad had died. I mean, I'm sorry, my grandpa had died. And I'm like, dang, Papa, like what the heck? I'd seen him a, a handful of times growing up, but and he was so awesome. If y'all, uh, for you old timers, y'all remember Walker and Rody Music Store downtown? That was he was the Rody in that. And uh, but man, he was awesome. And uh, found out, found out that uh, my dad had had him uh, addicted to prescription drugs and different things. They got in an argument. My dad left him uh, wherever they were over in East Texas, Marshall, Jefferson area. Left him, came back three days later to find him dead. Bro, I was working out for football, thought I was real bad, you know, and I'm just like, I don't know where my dad, is, or, you know, I don't know where he's at, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip his head off when I see him, you know. A, couple, a month or so later, we're in the apartments at Parkland Villa. We're going apartment, house by house, changing air conditioning filters. And I told the dude I was working with, I'm like, man, that's my dad right there. What, of, of all places, how in the world did he end up back in Bozier and living in the apartment complex, not only that we lived in, but that I was working at part-time for the summer. Now, I was part-time. I was so part-time, I didn't even have, I had this maintenance shirt that said Mike on it, you know. <laughs> my name's Mark, you know. It's like, it, it wasn't my shirt. It barely fit. I don't even know if I had it buttoned. It was like, Ur, you know, but... Uh, but I looked at him, I was like, man, he was then, 30 plus years ago, he was my age now, but he looked like he was 80 something. I mean, he could barely stand up and he was smoking and he was just like, and I, but I knew it was him, you know, and I went up to him. I was like, trying to bow up on him, you know, <laughs> and uh, I was like, hey, how's it going? Good day. And he was just, yeah, good day. Nice day. Isn't it beautiful day? And yeah, I was like, you don't know who I am, do you? And he looked at my shirt and I'm like, I'm not Mike. This isn't my shirt. I said, I'm your son, I'm Mark, and he, I think I saw something wet kind of go down his pants leg, you know, and he was like, what in the world? He said, well, son, how are you? I said, doing good, just working, uh, how's Papa? And I called him out on it. I didn't I act like I didn't know, but and he was just like, well, he passed away. I was like, you weren't going to tell us? And I, we had this little confrontation here, and, uh, man, I wasn't, I wasn't in my word back then, y'all, and I was, uh, so I, I could have easily just choke slammed this, this fragile guy, you know, that was, that I didn't refer to as my dad, you know, but it was just crazy. We went to lunch, came back, and the lady at the office said, Mark, uh, Mr. Rody in apartment such and such said he doesn't want you back in his apartment, that you claim to be his son, but you're not. I'm like, whoa, okay, okay, that's how it's going to be, and I, I remember just a couple of times over the next few years having dreams about just like, just laying into him, you know, and, um, get married you know I met Carrie uh, we get married you know in our early 20s and uh and shortly after that he passed away and um but I I had some guys man I was in um I was the Lord had moved me for 10 years over to West Monroe area West Monroe and I had no hobbies it was work you know when you grow up poor you work you know and we were working we're chasing that dream chasing that dollar you know, fancy cars, fancy houses, just chasing, just trying to build it up. I had, it was, everything was out of order. It was work, family, uh, family, work, and, and God. <laughs> you know, it, like God was like nowhere, uh, I don't even know if he was in the top. We'd go to church and, and things like that, but man. But I had some guys that I started going attending a Thursday night men's group with that uh, they were like, hey man, we're going to take a road trip. In a couple of weeks, we're going to go to Nashville, Tennessee. I'm like, dang. And, my, and Carrie was like, just go. I'm tired. <laughs> you know, just, you need to go. And uh, so, and it was just one night away. And we went to like a CenturyLink Center, a Brookshire's Arena Center type arena where the NHL team in Nashville plays. And it was a Promise Keepers event. And man, I'm telling you, we were up in the nosebleeds. And it uh, that night changed my life, y'all. It was a... Uh, 13 years prior, I'd asked Jesus to save me, and that was the def defining moment unto salvation, but I really didn't fully understand or comprehend 
relationship. You know, because how could I have a relationship with this heavenly father that I can't see when I didn't have one with my earthly dad that I could see, you know? And, uh, but the Holy Spirit spoke to me that night, and I just had this prompting where everybody had a note card, and the, and the guy, it was Michael W. Smith leading worship, and Joe White was doing the message, and he built this crazy dude, builds this 14 by 7 cross, and, uh, and man, we were up in the nosebleeds. The, the altar was so full, we didn't even make it down the stairwell past the concession stand because 15,000 men were doing business with God that day. And, uh, but before I moved out of my seat, which you are going to have the opportunity to, to do here in a little bit, uh, man, I, my car was blank. I was good. Dude, I'm at our promise keepers. We've been giving to the church financially a little bit. We're there every time the doors are open just about. But it was, uh, he said, what is standing in the way of you having a closer relationship uh, with God? And my car was blank, and the guy that was leading our men's Bible study, he had all, I didn't see what he wrote, but had written, but I knew he had some stuff on there, and he was like, you ready to go nail this to the cross? And I'm like, man, I just had this, the very first thing I, off my pen was pride and alcohol, and all these things started coming off, and I'm just like, let's go, <laughs> you know, and, but that weekend changed my life, y'all. My dad passed away. I don't think I went to the, uh, went to the funeral. I was bitter. A few years later, I was at another men's event, and the guy said, even if, even if someone that you need to forgive is dead, you need to forgive them. I'm like, are you talking to me? <laughs> He's like, I have forgiven him. I forgave him from my mouth, but not truly from my heart, you know? And I'm telling y'all, that weekend, I forgave my dad from my heart, and I don't know where he is, where his soul is right now. I pray I'll see him again in heaven. That's between him and the Lord. I pray that he had, a, had a, a time with God before he left this earth. But, man, I'm telling y'all, it was like a 1,000-pound weight it, uh, was lifted off my chest when I forgave him. You know, in Colossians it says, just as Christ forgave you, you must also forgive. This isn't something that we aspire to. It's an expectation uh, to forgive. So if you're holding, so maybe that's for someone here. If it's a neighbor, coworker, family member, Maybe it's somebody that's dead, that's not even alive, that you haven't forgiven. Maybe that, maybe that's, that testimony is for you. Amen? Fast forward a, a few years later, and uh, I don't know if uh, Ray Rainey has uh, made it back, but uh, we're, uh, he was on, on staff at First Bossier. That's where we're attending, doing men's ministry stuff. And he calls me. Oh, there he is, right on cue. It's like we, like we timed that out. Man, he called me up. I'm getting ready to go with Dr. Fred's son-in-law and his dad and another dude to an LSU-Mississippi State game, and I get a call from this guy, Ray Rainey, and he's like, do you feel like God's calling you to the ministry? And I'm like, kind of? I mean, I've always, not always, for the previous 10 years, Pastor, had felt that if you have Jesus living in you, we're all called to ministry, you know? So, I, But I didn't know what this looked like because my identity was in this vacuum cleaner sales company. I never called it that back in the day, but my identity was in that. I didn't know what that even would look like. And he said, I thought so. I'm going to put your name in the hat, you know, or your name in. I, I feel like we need a men's pastor here at First Bossier in, in 2011. I'm going to talk to Dr. Fred about you being our men's pastor. And I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> it's getting real now. And I get, uh, we go to church the next day, and and I, we're at lunch at Shane's, and Carrie drops her fork like, uh -uh, I didn't sign up for all that. You know, like, what in the world? For somebody like me, unqualified to do something like this. But, you know, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. So is he calling you? What is he calling you to that you're running from right now? So on October 10th, 2010, Dr. Fred is preaching on John 10, 10. The thief come only to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. But it, Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And, it, and so we had decided before then, because Ray, I was, I was, Ray, for a couple of months, was walking me through, like, and I'm like, I don't even know what to do. And he's like, and so many pastors and those that I was talking to said, is Carrie on board with this? Because y'all are a team. Y'all going to do this together. It's like, we're, we're ministering to men. Like, what? <laughs> no, mama needs to be on board, too. So it took her like a week and a half longer than me. But anyway, she, uh, but as a family, that Sunday, we went to the altar and said, here we are, Lord. Use us. Send us. I don't know what this looks like. I don't know what it means. So in 2011, 
they called me to be the men's pastor at, at First Bossier, and it's been it's been a journey over the last 13 years. That's been awesome. It's been exciting and it's been scary, <laughs> and uh, and it's uh, but it's, it's been awesome, y'all. So, uh, but he doesn't call the qualified; he qualifies the call. I want to read uh, another passage for you, uh, real quick. It's in uh, right above. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, there's two verses there in 26 and 27. So uh, uh, picture yourself here. For consider your calling, brethren, brothers and sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to uh, to shame the things which are strong. That's me. (laughs) That's me right there. He calls the foolish things. To shame the wise. So, one one encouragement that, I, uh, that I'm going to leave with you uh, that a brother in Christ uh, early on uh, encouraged me with is not to get uh, your calling confused with a career, career versus calling. And so, I was at, after uh, six and a half years uh, serving on staff at First Bozier, I was at a crossroads, and the Lord was telling me to to leave, to get out of the boat and trust him he said and i'm just like are you are you sure lord i was questioning the lord and in the call and and i didn't know what he wanted me to do i was thinking like am i supposed to do this vacuum cleaner thing again or do you want me to sell real estate or build houses and he said just because i'm moving your location doesn't mean i'm changing the call that i have on your life to reach and disciple men so in the summer of 17 we started uh, men of courage louisiana nonprofit. Uh, shortly after, I had ladies on me for like seven or eight years wanting to do Women of Courage, so the Lord raised up this one next to my wife, Miss Allie, uh, to lead our Women of Courage. And now 13 years later, we have 13 chapters of Men and Women of Courage, including uh, Men and Women of Courage in the Yucatan. Isn't that crazy? That's awesome. To God be the glory. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay. Okay. Y'all, y'all still with me? I feel like I'm putting y'all to sleep. I'm sorry. I just want to uh, tell you, too, that you don't forget the why you do what you do. Because even, even after surrendering, I remember a few years later, uh, it may have been Ray saying, we had this 24-hour prayer night, and, and uh, there, was a, there was a window of about four or five hours that we, were gonna, we wanted somebody every minute of every hour at the altar in Faith Chapel. And I said, hey, men of courage will sign up. We're going to have chicken and waffles. We're going to do all this. And... Uh, about at towards the end i finally you know we had it was only down to like two or three of us and i was at the altar and this is like we i surrendered to ministry for a couple of years and i'm at the altar pray and i couldn't even pray and uh i just kind of peeled myself off the altar was walking back to the back to write on a stone that we're going to put in this little monument thing and uh and that whole way back to the foyer, uh, the Lord in his still small voice was like, Mark, do you love me? Like that encounter with Peter. Do you love me? Three times. Do you love me? And I'm like, yes, I love you. And he broke me because we spell love, T-I-M-E. And I really wasn't spending time with him. I wasn't spending time in his word. In 2001, after that Promise Keepers event, I started opening my Bible for the first time outside of Sundays and Wednesdays at church. But I'm telling y'all, I wasn't spending time, real quality time with him. It sadly wasn't until 2019 until I read the Bible for the first time cover to cover. And I really feel like in that time, the Lord was saying, when you're serious about me, I'll start getting being serious about men of courage and what y'all are doing. It really wasn't until that time until it started expanding to all these different chapters all over, which leads us to Cumberland Farms. And it's because a lot of people are like, how's men and women of courage, Cumberland Farms, how's this our latest, really our hands and feet opportunity for not just men and women of courage, but for churches all and uh, individuals all throughout our region. Because we have men and women of courage saying, what are we doing other than just meeting and eating? Because we're good, especially as Baptists, we're good about that, right? Meeting and eating, you know? And so we started doing block parties out there. We didn't have a clue what we were doing. Allie goes on a mission trip with her son Tristan to Dallas and sees this urban farm, this community garden, Bonton Farms. And so after a couple of years of block parties and doing little Bible studies and stuff, we're, hey, let's start a community garden. I don't know anything about planting a garden. We, we planted our first garden in mid-June, and I showed up without any seeds or plants to plant. 
And those guys were looking at me like, who, what in the world? We didn't have water for the garden, but it's uh, the Lord's, he's so patient, he's so kind. But uh, I was waiting for somebody else to do it. And a, and a, and a buddy of mine said, uh, said, hey, how's that Cumberland Farm thing going? I said, man, we're still, we're excited about it. And he said, y'all sure have been talking about that a lot. I'm like, oh, my pastor in uh, West Monroe, who always said, it's not how many we seat in church, it's how many we send, to kind of go along with what you're saying. He also said, at the end of the day, when you're face-to-face -face with Jesus, he's not going to say, hey, Mark, well said, my good and faithful servant. He's going to say, well done. We've got to be doers, y'all. We can't just sit here and be hearers every Sunday. It doesn't matter how many Bible studies you sign up for. It doesn't have, matter, uh, none of that. You, can, you could read the Bible through and through every year. But if you're not actually doing it and, and applying the word, then it means nothing. Amen? So let's be doers of the word. So the most important call to answer is your call to salvation. So there's going to be a time here if, uh, if the, I don't know if the praise band wants to come up or how y'all do that at invitation. Or you want to, okay, yeah. So we'll, uh, there's going to be a time to response, to respond. Uh, we're all sinners in need of a savior. Uh, we've, uh, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, the wages, what we earn for that sin is death, eternal separation, sinful man from holy God. While we were still sinners, Christ died on the cross for our sin. And so it's, he, he made the cross as a bridge for sinful man to have a relationship with holy God. So if, there's, if you look at the DVD of your life, if the Lord, if the creator of the universe isn't able to hit the pause button on that moment where you've uh, asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, then do business today. Amen. I'm going to pray, and then, uh, and then we'll close that. Lord, we love you and praise you. Thank you so much for your word. It's, uh, Father, thank you for the opportunity to share about how awesome you are. Again, the only one worthy of our praise. And uh, so I pray, Lord, that, uh, that those that need to do business with you uh, won't be ashamed of the gospel, that they'll come forward. If just one turns to you, the heavens rejoice. And so will we. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.